I'm David Yancey. I'm attending here today a testimony of some of our meetings with Brother Branham, our, that we were in his meetings, and some things that happened during that time. Uh, my father was a non-denominational Pentecostal preacher uh, from, uh, the, I guess, the early 30s, or, uh, right on up until 1980-something he was there. And it, I was 16 years old when we heard about Brother Brown coming to Macon, Georgia. And we lived 50 miles from Macon. Uh, and of course the roads back in that day were, were dirt roads and uh, of course no interstates. We traveled US 80 some, but some of the roads were, were not even paved roads. Uh, the meeting began on June the 3rd, 1955. And we came to the first meeting, which was at Porter Stadium in Macon. And on the very first night, the first message that we ever heard Brother Branham speak on was uh, in the book of Jude, contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Uh, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And of course, it was such a, a great uh, message, and I guess there was probably close to 10,000 people that were assembled there at that uh, football field. Uh, not only did you have the, the bleachers you had out on the field itself, uh, was chairs set up, folding chairs, all over the football field. And uh, they had the, at the horseshoe, at the opening, they had the platform. So when Brother Branham preached uh, that message, of course we enjoyed the, uh, the message that he brought very much, uh, contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And he, he called a prayer line, and he began with uh, prayer card number one, and Brother Billy Paul, his son, which I think was 19 at the time, he, he was the one that handed out the prayer cards. And when Brother Branham started uh, on the first night, he began at verse, at the, the very first uh, prayer card, number one, I think through 25, he called out. And in this, the Holy Spirit went out in the audience many times. And Brother Branham, of course, followed the, the pillow of fire wherever it went. Uh, but there... Toward the end of the prayer line, he called out a man that was sitting right behind the, uh, I guess toward the front of the, uh, the uh, audience there, and uh, he, he told him, he said, uh, you have had uh, uh, two-thirds of your stomach taken out. You've also had three uh, heart attacks, and several things that he told him about his condition. He said, you are a preacher. And that preacher was from Alma, Georgia, and his name was Kelly. And Brother Kelly, had, had, uh, he was an Assembly of God uh, minister, and he had preached at my dad's church previous to that. So we, we knew about him, and we knew about his condition. So there, uh, Brother Brown, the first time i ever seen him, told him all about his, uh, how many uh, of his stomach was taken out, how many heart attacks he'd had. Also, he was a minister. I see a man sitting here looking at me. I believe it's... It's, it's only right here at the line. He's looking towards me. He's been in surgery, had an operation. He's cut part of the stomach away. About two thirds of the stomach has been taken away, and the gallbladder. And you've had two heart attacks. That's right. And you're a preacher. All right, go home. You don't have to come in here. You're healed. Jesus Christ takes you well. Amen. You believe with all your heart. Have faith. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. What about out there in the audience way back? You believe him way back? You shall see the kingdom of God. You believe he raised from the dead? He lives forevermore? Have faith in God. Oh, my. Every one of you can be healed. A whole group right now. So that was somebody that we knew very well. He'd been, he'd, uh, been to my dad's church and he preached there. And uh, so it, uh, it, was, it was tremendous to see somebody that not only that, uh, you know, many things happened, but to see somebody that you knew personally. And so that was on Friday night. So on Saturday night, 
Uh, my dad, he said, I'm going to uh, go early. You had to go about an hour early to, to get the prayer card. And to go back just a little bit to give his condition, in 1954, my dad had uh, sores come on his arms, and they wouldn't heal up. Stayed there for, I'd say, two to three months. And, of course, he didn't know what was causing it, but the, the sores just remained on his arms for that long period of time. And he went to... Dublin, they had a little help fair down there, and he went there, and uh, they, have, they had made different tests, and they found out that he had a diabetic condition. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor told him, he said, uh, this, uh, what has happened, he said, it's an acid buildup from, in your blood that was caused from the diabetic condition, and that's the reason the sores, it, it uh, just it stayed there for that period of time because it was an acid buildup. And so that was my dad's, he, he went on a very strict diet at that time, didn't go on, uh, he never went on insulin at that time, but he very, uh, very strict diet, and he checked his uh, sugar level every day uh, with, a, with a tester. And he had uh, controlled the, the, di the diabetic condition, he controlled it uh, real good with, the, uh, with, with his diet and what he ate that was... Uh, so anyway, that was what he wanted to go. He, he was only going to get, uh, he was still having a problem with that. Uh, he had to be real careful what he ate. And so he said, I'm going early. And so he, he left early and we, we followed on about an hour later. And when he got to the, uh, to the stadium, Brother Billy Paul he was handing out prayer cards. And my dad got prayer card number 51. And this is his testimony. He said, now, Lord, he said, uh, if it's was like it was last night, he said, my number won't be called tonight. We'd just been in one service, and, and the first night, Brother Brandon began with, uh, from the very number one, card number one. Well, his card was 51, but my dad said he went to praying. He said, now, Lord, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And said, now, they say this man is a prophet. And he said, the first time I ever saw him was last night. But if he's your prophet, let him call my number tonight. And if he tells me what my condition is, I will know that he is your prophet. So he prayed that prayer. Brother Randall preached on Jairus, the secret believer. And at the end of the message, he talks about calling a prayer line. And Brother Branham said, i tell you what let's do. Let's start with number 51. Well, that was my dad's number, and that was half of his prayer. If he's your prophet, let him call my number tonight. And if you tell me what my condition is, I will know that he is your prophet. And so he come up in the line, and Brother Branham told him, he says, hey, he said, you got a welcome spirit. He said, you are a believer. He told him to walk a little closer. He said, now you know you're in the presence of something besides a man. And, uh, of course, he described that sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, that pillar of fire that was there. And the, then Brother Branham, the vision broke, and Brother Branham said, I see blood dripping. He said, it's a condition of your, uh, your blood. It's an acid buildup. He said, I see you in the doctor's office, little thin man. And I see, he says that the, it was caused from a, a case of diabetes that you've, you've had. And he asked my dad then, he said, are those things true? And it was all exactly true. And even what the doctor had told him, uh, it was an acid buildup in his blood caused from the, the, the diabetes. And, uh, of course, he asked my dad, are those things true? He said, all true. I think he said about maybe three times he mentioned it's all true. And so there was, there was the two things that my dad had prayed. He said, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If this man is your prophet, let him call my number tonight. And if he tells me what my condition is, I will know that he's your prophet. Well, there was, he, was, he was the first one in the line, having card 51. And also, it was exactly what the doctor had told him. So there were the two things that my dad had prayed about, so we knew, uh, my dad said from that time he knew that Brother Branham was a prophet, and that was 1955, and he said, uh, let's see, he said, you're the first one in the line, let's see if he'll show us anything else. He said, I see a young man, he said, oh, it's your son, he's got an eye condition, and uh, it was my oldest brother, he was in the Army Air Force in World War II, and he'd almost lost uh, sight in one of his eyes. And he was drawing a uh, disability check from the government at, at that time. And so he told him about that. He said, I see a little girl. I said, oh, it's your son's daughter. It's your granddaughter. 
she was about 14 years old and they had, she was having trouble in school and uh, they sent her to the, to the eye doctor and they checked out she was having trouble back at that, at that time. They were writing the, uh, uh, the assignment was written on the blackboard and her eyes were so bad she could not read the assignment. So she was having trouble and Brother Brown told all about her, con her, <coughs> her condition uh, of you know, not being able to see good. As an honest man, if you are, would you raise your hand to the people that they might know that you can tell that you're in the presence of something besides man as supernatural? Now to anyone who stands this close between me and the man is that pillar of fire like it's just a circling between me and he. He knows. Now it'll drop to either he or I in a few moments. He, he knows he's in the presence, in divine presence. I do not know the man. I have never seen him. But now if the Holy Spirit should anoint well, he'll tell you something that'll encourage you or discourage you one. That I do not know. It'll have to take him to do it. But if he does, you will admit it then. If it's truth, you'll admit it. And you'll be willing to do anything that he tells you to do. And if it's the truth what he tells you, then you know his divine presence is here uh, telling me what to say to you. Isn't that right? Well, may he grant it is my sincere prayer, brother. You're the first patient here tonight. People, there's lots of faith in the audience. And they're moving from everywhere. Powers of sickness is moving in. And it's people's faith are doing it. See, it isn't me. It's their own faith pulls at it. It wasn't Jesus healed the woman. He said, thy faith has saved thee. It wasn't, it wasn't him. Her faith did it. And that's the same thing in here. Faith pulling from everywhere around now. But... I see that between you and I, there seems to be something like dripping. I see it moving between you and I, like drops of something are falling. It's a, it's a blood condition. It's something in the blood. It's, it's acids in your blood, I believe the doctor says. It's a, I see that kind of thin fella says it's an a, a acid in your blood, and it's caused by a case of diabetes. It has been... A diabetes has caused the acid to come into your blood. That's the truth. That's is that the right? That's right. That's the truth. That is the truth. I, you believe? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, see, the God. more you talk to the man, see, now that you might know, now I could just pray for him. I don't know. But I turn around now while the anointing is speaking and talk to the man. He might, it, just the longer you talk, but usually I don't say much to a person because these others are just weakened so. But that you might know now, I will just talk to the brother just a little bit longer, see if the Holy Spirit would say anything. Would you desire to see that if it be God's will? Pray that it will be God's will. That we might know just to, to talk to you now. Now, what it said was the truth. We'll see just what he would say again. And uh, if he should say anything, of course, it would be him. It couldn't be me. You know that. You realize that. I realize that. But ever what it was, of course, it seems to a dream now. It's another world. I see it moving between us again. You know, it's, a, it's another man. And the man's got something that's in his eyes. About a, Oh, it's a, it's a son. you got a boy or something, or a son, haven't you? It's got something wrong with his eyes. Uh -huh. And then you see a little girl. That's his daughter, which is your granddaughter. She's got something wrong with her eyes. That's the truth, yeah. folks. That's the truth. You I believe? Do. I believe. Now, I do. as you have believed, go and find it just the way you believe. <laughs> In the name of the Lord Jesus, I bless my Lord brother Lord for the glory of God. Lord Amen. Lord. May the Lord bless you, my dear brother. Just have faith. Believe God with all your heart. You can have what you want if you'll just have faith to believe it. All right. Now, as far as that is concerned, the whole audience ought to have faith now to be healed. Isn't that right? Everyone should have faith. Everyone should believe. I see the angel of the Lord hanging over a little lady looking right at me praying. Got trouble with your hip, haven't you, sister? Mm -hmm. You was praying, then you said, Lord, let him turn to me. You also have a hernia, don't you? 
That's right. And you've got a tumor, haven't you? If that's right, raise up your hand. Now you can stand up on your feet. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, heals you. And you're a well. Your faith has made you whole. <laughs> so there was, there was the, um, uh, the very first one in the line. And, of course, many other things happened in the meeting. Uh, we saw blinded eyes. We saw people that they rolled up on the platform, they had to lead them up, and uh, their eyes were restored, and they were able to walk off the platform by themselves. There was a little waterhead baby there that his head was uh, tremendously enlarged, and Brother Brown told the, the mother, said, you take, cut, take a string and, and measure that head, and said, every, every day, cut off the amount of that uh, that shrinks and bring in the thread. And she was bringing uh, night by night, a service by service. This lady was bringing in the piece of the, the uh, thread that, that she cut off that the little baby's head was uh, going down. Uh, another night, there was a, a man there that was, uh, he was on a stretcher. And Brother Brown, back in those days, uh, we had uh, segregation. The black people were sitting in one area and the white people in another area. And Brother Brown said, where is the black section? And he looked down, he said, oh, it's you. And he was right there at the bottom of the platform on a, on a stretcher. And I didn't know the man, but they said uh, the testimony that I heard uh, after that, the man had been uh, bedridden for 22 years, I believe it was. And Brother Bram said, you believe me to be God's prophet and God's servant? And he said, take up your bed and walk. And that man come up out, off of that cot, folded the cot off, up, and walked out across the, the, the football field. And there was a, I guess uh, you could have heard the, the, the shouts and the, as the people began to praise God. Uh, I believe you could have heard it for two blocks. And just, just one thing, many things happened. He told people what street they lived on in Macon. And, uh, one, one brother, he told him, he said, you, are, you, you work for a railroad company. And uh, he got hurt, I think, with his, uh, maybe his head. But he, he said, you live on certain, certain street. And Brother Cecil Cobb, he, he, was, he was at the meeting. He and his dad went by and the man was sitting on the porch the next day right there at that address where he was. And uh, of course, Brother, Brother uh, uh, Collins tells a testimony about Brother Brown telling him about a man living on a certain, at a certain uh, place. And uh, of course, he was sitting right close to some, some ladies said, well, he missed it right there. And so he said he went out to see what had happened. And those ladies went up that was neighbors, uh, had been neighbors uh, where this man lived. And come to find out, the man said, well, I just moved yesterday. And Brother Brown told him where he lived. Uh, and he just moved. And even the people that lived next door to him, or right close in that neighborhood, didn't even know that the man had moved. But he had moved. And Brother Brown told him the address that he was in. So in that meeting, we saw uh, just many, many people that were healed. And, and of course, messages like we had never heard before. Uh, he, he preached uh, Many, many messages. Two vines is one of the messages he preached. And, and uh, he, he preached on uh, uh, just, just different subjects that was just so outstanding. Uh, so we, we uh, attended all ten of those meetings. So it was about a hundred miles round trip. And we came up every, every service. It was one service at the city auditorium on Sunday afternoon. But we attended all ten services. We didn't miss a single one. And we'd, we'd go home after the service and come back the next evening. But it was a, a tremendous meeting from that. Uh, uh, we, we'd never seen anything. We'd uh, been in a Pentecostal church. We believed in all the gifts. My dad was a, a Pentecostal preacher. And we believed in divine healing and the gifts of the Spirit. But we'd never seen anything like that in, in that nature. Uh, we, we'd been in different meetings, for some healing meetings. A different one that uh, I could name the name, but we'd been in all those meetings. But here was something different from anything we had ever been in. And uh, so from that viewpoint, uh, there, we didn't have a tape recorder. Uh, we, we just uh, lived out in the country. And in fact, when I was, uh, probably during that time, we didn't even have a telephone. Uh, but we, uh, what we did at the time, didn't know there was tapes available of uh, the messages that Brother Branham had preached. I didn't know how to get them. Uh, so what we did at that time, we got, uh, we got everything that we could get as far as books was concerned. And that was a man sent from God, a prophet visit South Africa. And then we got the little, three little pamphlets, uh, Do You Fear Cancer, the Supernatural Gospel, and uh, another one that we got. But that was the only material that we, that we got. But we called Brother Branham a prophet from that time. But we didn't know 
we didn't know how he was identified in the scriptures. And we didn't understand, uh, without teaching on that, we didn't understand the seven church age messengers and the angel to the church. Uh, but we believed Brother Brandon was a prophet. And so from that, uh, we, we, we didn't know to go to Jeff, but we went, uh, we would keep up with, uh, my dad got Matt's and Bose's paper, Herald of Faith, and also the Voice of Healing. And, and a, lot of, a lot of times they would tell where Brother Brown was going to be. And uh, in 1958, we went up to Greenville, South Carolina. And my dad, uh, which was three years after he was in the makeup meeting, and my dad had, had come up with a peptic stomach problem. Whatever he'd eat would sour on his stomach. He had to be real careful what he ate. And he, we were sitting way back. He didn't have a prayer card at, uh, in that meeting. We was in textile hall, sitting way back in the, uh, probably halfway back, and it was a very long room. And my dad, his testimony was, he just bowed his head and he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says, reveal me to this man. And Brother Brown turned and said this, he said, this man's praying. And he described his, uh, the shirt that he had on, described his, he just had a little rim of hair. He described it, and he said, uh, don't let him miss it or something like that. He said, but, he said, what it is, it's a peptic condition in your stomach. He said, you go get your hamburger tonight with all the trimmings and eat it in the name of the Lord. And that's, I was in that meeting, so we went, we went that night. My dad got his hamburger with all the, with all the trimmings on it, exactly what Brother Brown's, I told him to do and, and healed him of a, God healed him of a peptic stomach problem that he had. And so from there, I, I think the next place we went probably was, was in Tifton, Georgia. Brother Brandon was in Tifton. And uh, I was working at the uh, air base at the time. And, but my dad went down on Friday. And uh, the first service was held at a little, little country church. And the, the pastor's name was Perry. And I don't know how you, he knew my dad, but my dad led the singing at that service. And Brother Branham preached uh, uh, at, at, at service, and my dad was sitting right behind him on the, on the platform. And I could hear my dad amen to Brother Branham as he preached uh, many times. I, I knew his voice very well. Uh, from there, the, it was a small church, and the people were, couldn't even close to get inside there. So they, they moved, it, moved it to the to the courthouse uh, there in Tifton uh, for the next service. Had two services at the courthouse. I went down and the, the courthouse was so packed full of people. I couldn't get in except in the, I was back in the uh, entrance to it and I could stand on my tiptoes and could look over the top of the heads of the people and see Brother Brown. There he was up at the judge's stand preaching, preaching uh, Real, the real judgment from the, from the, from the Word of God and, and uh, right, from the, right from the judge's stand. And so we, we were in that meeting and then uh, the next meeting we went to, we found out that Brother Brown was going to be in, uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, so it was six of us that went up uh, to that meeting and uh, it was, we heard Brother Brown as he preached uh, the wonderful message but nobody in our, in my, I, I drove my car, but nobody in the car had a prayer card. Uh, but my, my aunt and my mother was there, with her, which they were sisters, and they were sitting right on the front row of the, of, uh, of the Bixby Church in Columbia, South Carolina. Neither one of them had a prayer card. But my aunt, her son, uh, was born in 1940. And he was injured at birth and uh, almost died when he didn't walk till he was uh, over four years old. And through prayer, the, my dad's little church, he, he got somewhat better and he was uh, just all kind of medicines that he took. He had convulsions and, and his, uh, you could hear the bones cracking. And he was in, in real bad condition as a young, young person. So he, of course, he wasn't able to go to school at all. Uh, but then he got on up and got over some of his sicknesses and, and he become a very strong uh, young man, I guess. Uh, he got up in his 20s, maybe uh, close to 200 pounds. Very, very strong young man. And my aunt, uh, it, it got to the place where she, he, she couldn't do much with him. He would, he would have to uh, kind of come back at her. And so, uh, so she didn't know what to do with him. She didn't want to put him in a, in a home. She wanted to keep him at home, but she didn't. Uh, 
he had got to the place where she couldn't hardly handle him. But she come to the meeting, and then I had a sister, my younger sister. Uh, she was uh, she was married to a, a boy, an airman, and he was he was stationed over in somewhere in Africa. But while he was there, she uh, developed kidney stones, and uh, she couldn't pass the stones, and they she was placed in the hospital out at uh, the old military hospital at Warner Robins. <laughs> and in that, in doing the surgery, the, the stones had cut one of her kidneys up uh, so bad until they couldn't save the kidney. So they cut out, they cut, they cut one of the kidneys out in the surgery. And so it left her with one kidney. Of course, you can live with that, of course. She's still living now. She's, yeah, she's 80, 82 years old. But in that, uh, after that, she come down with an intestinal blockage, and it was she got very, very serious in that condition, and uh, so we we were praying and asking the Lord to help her, and they did. They were able to uh, get that intestinal blockage uh, taken care of, and uh, she had come home from the the hospital, but she was she was out. She was had one kid. She didn't have any children at the time. And of course, my mother was, uh, she was very concerned about, about her. So there she was with, uh, with my aunt and had the mental, uh, her boy was a, a mental condition. They were sitting right on the front. And Brother Brown said, now, do you see that pillow fire hanging right over those two ladies sitting right there? And then he, he, he told my aunt, he said, it's your son, he's got a mental condition. And of course, he was not even in the meeting. He was back here in Georgia, and that was in South Carolina. And uh, so from, if I, uh, Brother Brown then told all about his condition. Then we're right. To, now that has uh, moved right to that lady right next to you, which was my mama. And he said, "It's your daughter that you're concerned about." And she's had surgery. And uh, he told her uh, all about my sister and her condition. And uh, just uh, as your faith is, so be it to you. I don't know those people. They're strangers. Now, do you believe me? Yeah. Yeah. Here's my hands up, my Bible here. I, as far as I know, I've never seen them in my life. They're just people that's sitting there. Here. Oh, what a feeling. <laughs> Praise God. Brother, the Holy Spirit. Look, I pray you try to see this. Look right there beside that woman. Look at that light right there. See that kind of a milling soft glow light coming right down the corner? Did you see it? Look. Just this lady sitting right there. She's praying for a son. <coughs> Trouble with the mind. That's right, isn't it, lady? Raise your hand up if that's the truth. Just have faith. Thank God. That struck the lady next to you. There it moved right from that lady over to the next one. You all got a prayer card? You have a prayer card? No, you don't. All right, you don't need one. The lady next to you there, a light's right over by her. Just look this way towards me, sister, just a moment. You believe me to be his servant? Yes. It's your daughter just had an operation. You're praying about it. That's right. Raise up your hand. All right. Don't doubt. You'll get all right. You believe? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What you crying for, lady? You're all tore up, aren't you? You believe me to be his prophet? I'm a stranger to you. Don't cry. Hey, look, lady. Don't you do it. Don't do it. Now, I won't say it, but you're trying to fix it on to do something and don't you do it. It ain't worth it. Right. Leave it alone. Don't you do it. Keep away from it. Just get away. Ignore it. It'll come out all right. Don't, never take a life. Because it won't work. Stay away from it. You believe that I'm his servant? Amen. You don't live here. You're going to Charlotte now. That's right. Miss Mongo, you go back. Don't do nothing about it. And God will be with you and work it out all right. You believe? Just have faith. Don't doubt. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. Way back. 
way back, right at the back, was where that man standing with a white shirt on, a woman with a skin trouble. You believe that God will make you well, lady? You accept it? Believe it? That's right. All right, there she is. Just stand up on your feet so you can just praise God for it. And that will lead you. You have a prayer card? You don't need one. When you got faith like that, you don't need a prayer card. That's going to lead you because the shadow that was standing right there over you has left. Here's a lady sitting right down this way. She's, uh, God may she not. She's had trouble. She's had a wreck. And she's, uh, it's uh, causing her to get weak spells. Kind of a blackout like. She's not from here, from Georgia. Just believe Miss Griffin, <laughs> and you'll get well. I'm a stranger to her. I don't know her. Stand up, lady. Recognize the Lord Jesus as your healer. Do you believe, my friends? And so from that time, uh, my nephew, which was Pat, that had the mental condition, he was, uh, he got just as easy to get along with. My aunt was able to didn't have any problems keeping him at home, and he was he was just as uh, nice, and he bring him to church, and uh, he, he was just a complete different person. He was about he was about 21 years old at the time. Never never been to school, but he was, uh, and he's still living today. He's about uh, 77 now, and uh, of course my aunt's been dead for several years, but now he's he's at home, and his oldest sister got an Alzheimer's condition. And there he is now, as to be in that mental condition up to up to 21 years old, and now he's at home helping helping look after his own sister that's got all out. And it's just it's, uh, it just as easy to get along with, and God God really, you know, of course he's never been to school a day in his life now. And uh, but but he uh, everything all that problem that she had with him was all gone. And then my sister, uh, after Brother Randall prayed for. He told her my aunt, my mama, her condition. She's had th she had three children after that, and uh, and of course she's made it real good with one kidney and uh, all these years since 1962, and uh, she's still living with about she's about 80 82 years old I guess now, and uh, so it was just just one thing after another that that, that happened in those meetings, but we still we still didn't know. Uh, the scriptural application uh, of uh, Brother Brown's ministry and what God had sent him for. We believed he was a prophet all those, all those times and read those books and anything we could, uh, any paper that we could get that had anything about Brother Brown. The Herald of Faith had an excerpt uh, back in those days. We took that magazine, uh, uh, Brother Batson Bose, we took that magazine for years. And that he'd have an article or part of a message in there, uh, printed in there from Brother Brandon. We always read those. But we didn't know anything about having tapes. And so from then, uh, we, we went to those meetings, I guess. Uh, um, personally, I was probably in 15, 16, 17 meetings, I guess, of, of Brother Brown. I was 16 when he was in, in Macon uh, as a young boy. And uh, that was, I was in, uh, I think I was in 11th grade in, in school. And so from there then, I got, uh, I got married in 1962. Uh, and of course, uh, my wife, uh, she was uh, Ruth Garrett. Her dad and mother and their family was in Brother Jack Palmer's church when he was in the Congregational Holiness Church down on Hazel Street. And I didn't know Brother Palmer. But Brother Palmer was very instrumental in getting Brother Brown to come to Macon in 1955. The church that uh, they were in was a Trinitarian church. And Brother, uh, Brother Palmer, actually, he got some tapes I, I, I heard after that. And he wanted to be, he saw the Godhead and he saw uh, to be baptized in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he did those things, and they brought him before the the uh, the church committee, and they put him out of the organization, and that was the Congregational Holiness Church, which was a Trinitarian uh, Pentecostal ch uh, church. Uh, I didn't know him, uh, but Ruth and her family knew Brother Palmer very well. And the reason I'm saying this, I got something else to tell a little bit further on that involves Brother Palmer, and. So when Ruth and I got, got married, we started attending the same church uh, that, that Brother Palmer had been previously the pastor of. Had somebody else, Brother Bateman, I think, was a pastor at the time. And my dad had always said, as long as I can remember, my dad said there's 900 and something different denominations. He said, I believe if Jesus was here, he wouldn't join any of them. He said, so I'm not going to join any, any organization. I'll fellowship with anybody that I can. He said, but I, I don't believe he would join, so I'm not going to join. I'm not going to become a part of an organization. That was my dad's stand. The reason I'm telling that, I started going, and they, put, they say, I started teaching the you, uh, young adult class there at, uh, at the uh, Congregational Holiness Church. And so they, they put pressure on me to join the church. Well, I, the first time I would not do it because I knew I'd been taught that by my dad all those times. And a little later on, uh, of course I, I, I'm, I'm having to tell some, some things that I'm not too proud of, but uh, a little later on I joined the church. Well from there I've been preaching since I was 16 years old. And uh, so I was about 20, 24 I guess at that time. And so what they did, they gave me a uh, I got what they call local preacher's license, and that's what you could get there initially. I kept those licenses for about a year, and then, then I was ordained in the Congregational Holiness Church, and uh, didn't even <laughs> believe in Brother Randall was a prophet, but didn't know, didn't know, we just didn't know a, a lot of things about doctrine, uh, that, you know, we, we just didn't have tapes, but from that viewpoint then, I, uh, after that, they had a little, uh, there was a little church down in Jeffersonville, Georgia, and uh, they needed a pastor. My dad had been there. Uh, we, uh, him and Brother Frank Shepard was instrumental in uh, building the church. And uh, so they elected me to be the pastor of the Jeffersonville Congregational Holiness Church. But the thing, uh, the church there had pulled out of the organization, uh, not over the, the doctrinal issues, but over something about uh, controlling the property or something. So they were united Congregational Holiness. And I was ordained in the Congregational Holiness. And the reason I'm saying all that, then in, uh, I was there pastoring that church, and, in, and uh, then I heard about Brother Brown being in the, uh, having passed and being in the accident, and I was really concerned. I wanted to find out what had happened. Uh, and so I went to my wife's, they knew Brother Palmer real well, because he was pastoring that church when they were back in the, in the early 50s. And... I was talking to my father-in-law. He said, I know somebody that can tell us what happened. And uh, so he knew where Brother Palmer lived. I didn't know Brother Palmer at the time. We, so we went out to, to where he lived. That was in January of 66. And he told us he'd, uh, what had happened the best he could. And I think he even went to the, uh, I believe he went there with Brother Brown in the hospital for a period of time. But when we got ready to leave, Brother Palmer said, I got something I want to give you. And uh, the church age book had just been put out just a short time before that. And so Brother Palmer handed me a church age book. And uh, at that time, I was, I was in the Air National Guard. Uh, I worked a full-time job at the base. I was also passing the church at Jeffersonville, which was uh, Sunday school church on Sunday morning, church that night. I went to my dad's church on Sunday, Sunday afternoon and went tonight. And I was a very, very busy person. I was also going to take some college courses at the time. And he handed me that book. Well, usually, I've been in this Air National Guard for, uh, this is my fourth year. The, the first three years, for the two weeks, they sent us down on the west coast of Florida. One time to Tampa, one time to Panama City, one time to, uh, to Eglin. But this time, they sent us up to, in, in uh in the wintertime, usually we went in the summertime, uh, they sent us up to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in, uh, in North Carolina. Well, we, we went with a group of people up there. The reason I'm telling this, this is when I really began to see the doctrinal issues. 
I carried the church age book with me. I had been able to, and my Bible. And when we got to the to the air base, we reported for duty on Monday morning. And uh, the gentleman that was in charge of the uh, project that we were supposed to be working on, he said uh, there's supposed to be a van coming up from uh, McCoy Air Force Base in, in Orlando. He said the van hasn't got here yet. He said, so I don't have anything for you to do. He said, just go back to the barracks and do, you know, I'll do, go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Just report back in. So we went back to the, where the, the barracks. The rest of them went to town. I was the only person left in the, in the barracks. So I had my Bible. I had the church age book. That went on for two weeks. We reported back in. Uh, the last time we reported was on Friday. And the band still hadn't arrived. So I had... For two weeks, I had nothing to do but everybody gone with me in a private place. All I, all I had to do was read my Bible, read the church age book, and pray. And I read the church age book from cover to cover. And that's when I really began to see the Godhead, the water baptism. And then you know, he come on over where he, Brother Ram said, come out of here, talking about Babylon, come out of here, my people. It's just like he called my name. Uh, so I, in, in all of that, I, I said, Lord, if you just let me get back home. I'm, I'm, I saw the Godhead because the church age book covered the Godhead very thoroughly. I said, I get back home, I'm going to be rebaptized. And so I, and, and also, I said, if you just let me, I'm going to take these ordination papers and I'm going to turn them into the overseer. And so when I got back to Macon, uh, after that two weeks, and by the way, when we left out on Friday afternoon, the band was coming in two weeks late, but God kept it somewhere for two weeks while I had nothing to do, and I read the church age book from cover to cover. And I read my Bible and prayed. So I had uh, two weeks with nothing to do and nobody but me and the Lord there in the room. And, and just as quiet, everybody else was gone. Whatever they, I don't know what they did, don't care what they did. I just know what happened to me. So when I got back home, I, uh, I took the ordination papers, and carried him to the uh, district overseer. And I told him, I said, I just feel like handing these papers in to you. He didn't ask me why. I didn't try to tell him why. I, I, was, I was wanting to give them away, and he wanted to take them, so I just handed them over to him, just as smooth as it could be, with no problem whatsoever. And then from there, I got, uh, got rebaptized. Brother Palmer baptized me, and, the, and I was still, at that time, was pastoring the, uh, the, the church, which was... <laughs> and, uh, uh, in an organizational church and I pastored that church about a year without any license uh, they didn't know I didn't have any license but I tried to what little I knew about the Godhead I tried to um, to share it with them and uh, but they were they were they were uh, they had a woman there that played the piano she was she was a woman preacher and I prayed why we're not in the denomination she carried to her house and played that I tried to get her to see what she should be preaching to, and uh, and uh, so from there, I, I tried to preach a little bit on the Godhead and water baptism. And, uh, but then uh, there was a, they had a, a midi uh, They come up and he said, we've taken advantage of the church. And so I said, well, I feel like it's, it's time for me to uh, resign. So I resigned the church. I believe it was in 67 maybe. And uh, uh, not having anywhere to go. People said, where are you going to go? I don't know where I'm going. But I, I resigned the church. And... And, uh, of course, they, they came up. They didn't want me to leave. It's a small church. The church was beginning to grow a little bit. And uh, people were beginning to see the Pente what they call the Pentecostal blessing coming from the Methodist church. And uh, But anyway, I left. And uh, so then uh, I, uh, I I went to my, my dad. had a little service down there on Sunday afternoon. And Brother Ross and I went to Brother Palmer's. Uh, started going there. Uh, but it was, it was all a complete change. From uh, being a pastor of a church to, to come out not having a, a church anywhere, and I, so I started going to Brother Palmer's. Uh, of course, later on, uh, uh, he he started helping me to. Uh, he had a lot of contacts, and he uh, he he called places. I guess during the maybe from '68, '69 up to about uh, 1979 to '80. I probably preached at uh, probably 50 different message churches across the southeast. And uh, I was uh, going to Brother Palmer's church, but I, uh, any, any weekend that I was, wasn't out preaching, I was at his church. And uh, so from that viewpoint, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we started this little church here, Faith Tabernacle. We started this church uh, in April of, uh, 
I mean, I'm sorry, in, in 1982, January of 1982. But we didn't, we didn't, uh, when we first started, we were not a church. We were just, uh, some people were sitting at home playing tapes and they wanted to, they wanted to start a church. So we, we said, well, let's, let's just have church for a year and, and uh, for a period of time and see if it's, a, uh, see if it's a blessing and a help to the people. If it's not, we just, we just cancel it out. So that was January of 82 and we had that for a year. People started coming in from different places and, uh, you know, some people that, uh, we started off with about 16 people. So it was, uh, and so in, in, uh, a year later, uh, we, we had a meeting and that's when we, uh, they elected me to be the pastor and we didn't have a one deacon and have nobody qualified on it, but one, one deacon and, and, uh, we, and, uh, they went out, they went back and, and named the church, maybe Tabernacle. So we we stayed there on that. We were down in the, uh, at Faith Farm, which was uh, the Methodist people had that as a uh, people to go out and what you call a uh, retreat like. And but they were never used. All the all the Methodist people went down to uh, they went down to the coast. They got a big place down on on, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean and a nice place down there. So, but anyway, we we had the service there in a double wide trailer. And when we first went in there, there was a, another group of Pentecostal people that had, the, had service in the morning. So the only thing we could do is come in after they left. And I think we, we started about 3 o'clock, I think, in the afternoon, had a little afternoon service. And uh, that went on for a period of time, and we went in. And uh, so after, after uh, I guess, um, a few months, uh, we went in one Sunday afternoon for the service. And there was a... A note up said we have we won't be we've left here we got a, a, another building out a uh, church we so we won't be here so we we were able to start having Sunday morning services and so it went on for a number of years uh, uh, we uh, and then the uh, Methodist people they decided to just close that out they were they were renting the property from uh, uh, the lady on it was had to miss uh, pulling down it. Uh, Benson Valley, and so there we were. They, they moved out. They had a, a several. Of, uh, they had a kitchen there with to the, and also a double, the double wide trailer. There was another trailer there, and so the the Methodist people owned all that property. So there they were moving out, and we were losing our church. Uh, that we'd been there, I guess, six seven years. There was an old dormitory there that was very run down. And that's the only thing that was left on the property. The, the Methodist people moved everything else out that they could, you know, trailer, they could move all that and all, everything. That they, so I, we, we went to the lady that owned the property and we asked her, not having anywhere to go, we asked her if we could, uh, if we could rent that dormitory. The dormitory was very, it was very bad condition. We put an air conditioner in there, we did the, we did the, the, uh, uh, the building. And we moved in there, and we could see, I guess, about a, a hundred people. We built a, uh, we built a porch out there. One of the main uh, purposes for the porch was to have feet washing, because we didn't have any rooms to separate. So we, we had that building out of, uh, built that porch for that reason, and we stayed there uh, on that property. We stayed there for exactly 14 years, and then we decided uh, they were talking about. And later on the property about her son maybe building a house in that area so we'd already been uh, one one time didn't have a place to go so we started looking for some property to build us a church and we had uh we had uh, maybe a hundred people that was coming to coming to the meeting at that time which the building was just pretty well packed out one little bathroom and uh just uh, uh so we we uh we started looking for some property and we found, uh, in fact, Brother, Bra Brother uh, Palmer's son, Byron Palmer, he came here and found this property here, and it was about six acres, which is just one hour, one hour off the interstate. And we, we was able to purchase this property, I think, for $22,000. And in the property, there was two acres of, uh, uh, of, of big pine trees that had probably been there 80 to 100 years. And... Uh, so what we did, we, we sold the property, I mean we sold the, the trees and uh, the Shepherd Brothers, which I had 
uh, they, they, they had the logging business and, and uh, he come up and uh, did the logging for us and we, we, we had about, I think it was about 30 something trees and they were so, the trees were so big until they had to cut them in two and we got $9,000 out of the trees in two acres. So we brought our property down to $13,000. Uh, six acres of uh, property, one mile from I-75. And so we, we saw how God uh, had blessed us. And so this was in 95. And I felt like, I said, Lord, we have been on the, we've been uh, this coming year, January of, of 96, we will have been at uh, the property where we were for 14 years. That would include the time we was in the double wide trailer. I said, Lord, I believe you're going to help us to get our building ready so that we can move in and begin in the third uh, seven years. And uh, of course, uh, so we started building. We, we, we got a, uh, a loan for a 15 year loan, I believe, to, to uh, build, a, build a building with. And so we built it. And on, on, on December, the last day of December, uh, we finished up putting the air conditioning in, get everything set up, and we had our first services here in January of 96, which was exactly 14 years from the day that we started down at the other place. And so God let us have, have that property, and have this property, and uh, we had a 15-year loan. We have never had a building fund. We have never asked, we've never taken an offering for the building fund, the building church. And we've never, we've never uh, 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 asked anybody to pledge anything, never took an offering. And by the grace of God, we paid that we paid that loan off in one year, and that was in '96. We have not owed anything on this property uh, since uh, that was paid off in one year, and uh, so everything that we have here, the building, uh, the fellowship hall, the add, adding on to the building, there, there's not been we have not we've never owed uh, anything on it anything from that time from '90 uh, well it was '97 I guess when we first paid it off. And so from that viewpoint, I've got just a couple of other things I'd like to say. Uh, when, we, when we got uh, a post office box number, not, didn't request any number, but at that time there was about 1177 messages, that's what they said was available, and, uh, and without asking, our post office box number was number 1177, so it tied in exactly, I think it's about 1200 maybe now, but back in those days it was 1177. And then, uh, then the telephone number that we got here at the church, all these things just, uh, 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 it means something to me. Uh, uh, Brother Ram said that uh, when that, those angels there, was, he, he mentioned about 30 and 27. One time he said 26, but he said 30, 27. So anyway, our telephone number was, without asking for it, was 30, 27. So I've always remembered uh, that, the, that was a, uh, the seven angel when they came down. And then Brother Brown said, not even knowing what we were doing, uh, the the uh, we, we we built the church, and the church the audience faces the east, and we didn't set it up that way. But Brother Brown said, you you want the audience to face the east. That was Brother Brown mentioned about that because Christ comes in the east, and so he uh, the church was set up. And originally, in our original building, we had seven windows, and so it just. Uh, uh, we, we went and got some, uh, some uh, blocks that was decorated blocks and uh, we went to the uh, concrete place, Matthew's Aiken, and they had these, uh, these uh, what is 12 inch, the big blocks. And uh, he said, uh, we've got so many on the yard here, yes, decorated blocks. He said, a man ordered them several years ago and then decided he wanted something else. He said, you can, uh, so he gave us a real good buy on the on the big blocks and but now those particular blocks for that the kind of design that was not they didn't make that design anymore i don't know if anybody around and when we got through building the building uh we had to take some blocks out to put the duct work in and we we come exactly we're not not any more blocks available with that that particular design we come out i think we had we the last two blocks we finished up the building so we come out exactly to the number, uh, exactly the amount that had, and they didn't have any more on, in stock of that particular one. So it, it, it's just been uh, so many things that God has, has done for us. And 
And uh, one thing we've done that uh, I, I ask our people uh, from the very beginning, I said, don't ever go and try to get anybody from any other church. I said, I don't care. And don't, don't get involved with what, what they teach. I said, that's, that's up to them there. They're sovereign. I said, but don't go to anybody. I said, I don't want to. I said, uh, we, we don't want to. We don't believe we shouldn't proselyte. I said, don't try to proselyte and get people to come. I said, if God wants us to be here, he'll have somebody to come to, come to the service. And so we, we taught it that way from the very beginning. And I don't know what, I hope nobody's uh, trying to do any of that, but that's, that was the way we were taught uh, from the very beginning. Don't, don't proselyte and don't get involved with anybody else's. What, what, I said, if you hear something about the church, leave it alone, pray for them. I said, but don't get involved with anything that they're uh, Say, well, you're not teaching the right thing or whatever it might be. I said, let them, be, you, you just pray for them. I said, let that be between them and God. So anyway, from that viewpoint, then we've been here uh, since 82. And if this come in January, that'll be uh, 2018, 18 and, and 18. it be 36 years we've been here uh, as a little church. Uh, well, one year we was without being a church. We've been here on this property. Uh, since uh, January of, uh, of of 96. So we've been here now 18 years coming up, uh, I believe it is, uh, this coming January. And so uh, God has blessed us. I will say this, and i got, I don't know how long we're talking to close out, but we had, uh, at the old church, we had a brother, and I'm sure Brother, brother David, you know, and Brother Mike Honest came down to preach for us. And he was up around Jefferson, Georgia, or somewhere at that time. And we was at the the uh, the old old church down there. That uh, the the platform was it, it was a cement floor. And uh, we was having it was the first Sunday of that particular month when he was here. And we was having communion and feet washing that night. And Brother Hannes was preaching, and he brought that scripture unless a grain of uh, a wheat falls in the ground and, and dies, and it abides alone. And he quoted that scripture, and about that time, he fell backwards. And uh, I was sitting uh, on the left-hand side, and he fell back toward the, I guess, where the piano and the piano stool was. And uh, I, I sat there, I said, that's the most realistic demonstration I've ever seen in my life. And we had a, a lady that was in the church at the time. She was a nurse. And then we had a brother that was a, a paramedic. And both of them, they went up. And my wife come over, and I couldn't see him. He hit that concrete floor so hard until his glasses bounced off his head and went across the, across the floor. And so both the, the, the nurse and the uh, paramedic, they went up and checked his pulse several places there where the first barrier and they said he had no pulse. Uh, so we got there, didn't have a telephone in the church. The uh, only thing you could do to get to a telephone, you, you, and I don't think we had, probably didn't have a cell phone available either, I don't, as far as I know, I, I know I didn't have one. Uh, but we got to praying. And I told the people, I said, I just stay calm. I said, uh, don't, don't hover up. I said, just stay in your seats and pray. And somebody run, run up, I uh, a cell phone out there, not a cell phone, a, a phone in a booth up here. And they run there to call the, the, the uh, ambulances to come. And we got to praying for him. And he uh, he come to. And we took him, lifted him up, and set him up in a, a, a seat in a, a pew up there on the, on the platform. And as he was sitting there, I was looking right in his eyes. And his eyes reversed in his head. I know it did that because I was looking right at him. His eyes reversed in his head and he went out again. And he was started falling and we grabbed him and put him back on the floor and laid him down. And uh, so we, we prayed for him uh, again. And he come back too. Uh, and, and, and Brother Random says, you can't, there's one thing you can't do, you can't reverse your eyes. And his, his eyes reversed in his head. I, I was looking right in his eyes when it, when it happened. And we prayed and come back too. And sometime after that, the ambulance came and they put him on a stretcher. Uh, and and when he when he they uh, carried him out, he was just as white as a sheep. And he carried him out to the uh, Hampton County Hospital. 
and we was having we was having uh, Lord's Supper and communion. Uh, we 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 said, well, what we'll do, we'll go ahead and have the communion because it's already set up for that. But we know we won't have Lord's Supper. I mean, we won't have a, we won't have the feet washing tonight. We try to go to the hospital, and so we his daughter was with him at the time, and so she went with him in the in the ambulance over to the house and county hospital. A group of us went, and we went to the waiting room. We sat in there about an hour, and looked out, and here come brother. Uh, Hannes walking down the hall uh, with his suit on just like nothing had ever happened to him and uh, so I don't know I don't know what happened I just know he didn't have any pulse we had medical people said he didn't have any pulse and I know his eyes were bursting in his head but he went to he, he come I said well why don't you spend the night he said no I'm going home and he went to his own doctor and they didn't find anything wrong with him and he's I think brother Hannes is still living today but that happened right, right in our, we saw a man, uh, to me, uh, from all the, the medical, the, the nurse and the paramedic said there was no pulse. And I, I know he hit that floor, uh, he, he just barely missed the piano stool, but he, he hit that floor, uh, and, and when I went up, he was out, he was gone. Just that, and no, no pulse then, that the, 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 from the, the, I didn't know how to check it, but they did. But it, it, we've seen God do do great and mighty things. Uh, uh, I'll soon be 79 years old, and the Lord has blessed me and helped me over the years. Uh, I've, uh, I, in, the, in the 36 years that we will have been here, coming up, I guess, in, uh, in January, uh, other than being out of town, I haven't missed, I haven't missed about three services in 36 years. Uh, unless I was out of town. And what, I went in the hospital one time with kidney stones on Saturday night. Uh, they got the kidney stone, it, it passed somewhere or another, and it got rid of it. And I, so I didn't get to come on Sunday morning, but I come on Sunday night. And so the, the Lord has been so good to me to let me uh, uh, be able to attend for 36 years. I can count on one hand the times I've missed, other than being in, out, out of town for my a trip or something. And, uh, so it's, it's uh, so I, if, if the people, when they come to church, they expect me to be here, because I'm, I'm going to be here. And the Lord will, unless say something drastic happens. And I don't know how long I'll be able, but, but right now, uh, I, I'm in extra health. Uh, the Lord's helped me. Uh, I'm going to say this, but I, I got up, I, my weight got up to 280 pounds, and I got the people praying for me. And my weight right now, I went to, and I haven't been on a diet per se, but my weight went from 280 to 235. And uh, so, uh, and I believe that was from, from prayer. People praying that the Lord would help me. And so I, I would like to get down to my 200, but I, you know, I still got a ways to go. But uh, to, to lose 45 pounds uh, without going on a very strict diet, uh, I, I just give the, the honor to the Lord. And my wife and I, we've been married for 55 years. It's been, uh, so she's been very faithful to be with me in church. And uh, so we, we, I'll say one other thing. When we was uh, our 50th anniversary, the church, uh, they wanted to do something. So they, they got together and donated money for us to go to Israel with Brother George Smith. So we went with Brother George Smith to, to, uh, to Rome and to Israel. And uh, I will say this, that we went out on the Sea of Galilee. And I asked Brother George, I said, Brother George, can I sing that man from Galilee? He said, I could. So the, the captain of the, of the boat, I don't know who he was, but he was, he was from, that, from that country over there. And I sang that man from Galilee while we was on the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, of course, I'm going to tell you what the, the captain said. He said, you sound just like, uh, what's that man's name? This famous singer of... <laughs> Johnny Cash. Johnny, so you sound like Johnny Cash. I don't know whether that was a compliment or not. <laughs> but anyway, we sang, and but we we had a wonderful time there. So went to Jerusalem and 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 uh, uh, just had a great great uh, time there in, in that country. And the church uh, they they wanted to sponsor that for us. I didn't I didn't ask them, but they they wanted to do it, and they did that for us, which we very much appreciate that. And so we've seen God uh, do many things for us. We've had uh, we've had the meetings. Uh, we started having fellowship meetings, and it was in August uh, uh, that we started off in 1999, and then we changed it over to Labor Day, 
we've had a we've had a Labor Day uh, an August meeting uh, every year. Uh, so this is uh, 17 and uh, so 18 years we've had those those services. And uh, what we did uh, uh, back in the uh, I guess uh, seven eight years ago. We had so many people coming to those meetings. We couldn't. We couldn't handle the people. People driving in, some from overseas, and um, our our church seated about, uh, I guess about just two hundred people, and you could put a hundred chairs in, and then maybe in, in a situation like that, sometimes we have seven eight hundred people. We put them downstairs and they were in the hallway everywhere, uh, and put screens up, and finally we built a fellowship hall. We call it a fellowship hall, but the, the main reason we built that was to have a, an overflow for the people. And so we, we could see 300 people there, and, uh, and, but, but still the people didn't want to be, they didn't want to be downstairs in a hallway with the screen. They didn't want to be out, they, they, uh, they would come sometime at 3 o'clock, sit here until 7 o'clock that night to, be, to get inside the building. And so it, it kind of put a lot of pressure on us, uh, but we did uh, put a screen outside and have several, you know, hundred people out out in the fellowship hall. And then uh, a few years ago, we decided we would add on to the church. We didn't need the room for ourselves, but we added on to the church because people wanted to be in the auditorium when they came. And so we we, we added to the church, and now we can see uh, in the building itself we can see the about. Uh, between 400 and 450 people, but you can put chairs out. You can seat another uh, hundred or something. We put we put 500 and, uh, maybe in the church. And the last few years, everybody's been able to get in church because our our attendance has gone from 700, 800 down to 4, 500. And so anyway, everybody wants to can sit in church now. They, that makes them happy. And so uh, just just give it a little. Uh, but but all the the, the uh, uh, all this property we have. We also bought uh, uh, about three more acres that give us some frontage and so we got right, I think eight or nine acres here now and uh, so we, we got, got uh, a nice facility here and uh, never never an offering taken up and never anybody pledged. And never, never, ask any, never even asked anybody to pledge anything or to give anything but the, the, the Lord has helped us to pay for everything. So we, we are debt free and been debt free for, for uh, since 1997. So I, I give the Lord praise for that. So we don't have to, we don't have to ask. We don't have to push. So we just, uh, the, the people pay the tithes and, and the offerings to take care of the, the power and the, the insurance and whatever. You know. So anyway, the Lord's good to us. And what we're looking for now is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I was sitting in two waiting rooms this week. And I thought of what, of what Brother Brown said of sighing and crying for the abomination that's in the land. And there was uh, my, my youngest son, he had uh, his arm operated on. I sat there in that, that waiting room and to see the, the women, not a single one of them had on dresses. And, and uh, the way they were dressed and, and, and uh, hair cut off, just, just bobbed off. And, and I got to thinking, I said, oh God. I said, and it's such a such an atmosphere. Then they have the television on with that lesbian woman on there, you know, right there in the waiting room. And so you you, you know you get it, it, the uh, the atmosphere is just everywhere you go is just sin and and corruption and and people have got gotten so far away from God. And I, I thought about scripture and I uh, had my, uh, my son and then I, I had my wife yesterday to to get some glasses. And the same way. I said, oh God, and I, I really believe that in seeing all that, that I understood what Brother Branham said, and he went back to the book of the Old Testament, sighing and crying for the abomination in the land. And uh, we know that judgment is, is soon coming, and the Lord Jesus is going to come and get this little bride out of here. And I'm longing for that day when we'll, that resurrection of those that's gone on, uh, we see Brother Branham, see my dad, my mother, all these, um, all these wonders, Brother Canada, your dad, all these old timers that's going on. I'm so looking forward to seeing them. So God bless you. I trust that uh, what I've said has been a little, little help to you. And uh, if it has, just give the Lord praise and honor. We all everything that we do, we want to.
we give him praise and honor. He's the he's one that helps us uh, anything that we do. Without him, we could do nothing. So God bless you is my prayer.